Good evening and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining Quantum Mutual Funds webinar. My name is Raina Shivdasani and I will be hosting this session. The topic for today is ESG investing scaling to new highs. Here's everything you need to know. I would like to begin by introducing you to our speakers for this evening. Mr. Chirag Mehta, Senior Fund Manager, Alternative Investments, and Ms. Sneha Joshi, Associate Fund Manager, Alternative Investments. Before we begin the session, I would like to request you all to plug in earphones for an optimal listening experience and ensure you are connected to the Zoom audio. As a default setting, your audio and video is disabled. Hence, please type your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom panel of your screens, which our speakers will address post their presentation. Hi, Sneha, handing it over to you now. Hi, Raina, thank you so much. I, I would like to welcome everybody to today's webinar. Environment, social, and corporate governance, or ESG, has become one of the most discussed topics, not just among the board members, but also among the regulators and within the investor community. So it's important for us to understand how ESG investing is different from any other investing and what kind of parameters one should look at while evaluating a company based on ESNG. So let us get us, let us start to understand by, by what is ESG investing. It's important for us to understand that how company is taking care of environment. Is the company planting enough trees? Is company using renewable resources? Or is the company just polluting the environment? It's important for us to know that whether the company is disrupting the environment or protecting the environment. So E in ESG stands for environment. The pandemic has highlighted the importance of society and the community. It's important to evaluate the company based on social aspects and what company is doing to take care of its community. The corporate social responsibility. Is the company actually doing something in terms of CSR, or is it just for namesake? Is the company actually trying to take care of its employees, its suppliers, or they are just taking, or they are just being taken for granted? The S in ESG stands for society, because if the company is not taking care of environment and society, it is going to affect us all, including you and me. Coming to the third aspect of ESG, which is G which is the heart of ESG, that is the governance. It's important that the company follows good governance practices because without that, it's impossible for any business to have any policies and implement it in a successful manner. To have environmental and social policies, it is crucial that the board is independent. It's important that the independent board takes care of all the stakeholders which are associated with the company, including the minority shareholders, which is you and me. And what happens if the company is not following any good governance practices? There are cases of frauds, there are cases of corruptions. And what happens because of that? It results into financial losses, not just for the company, but also for the investor. All these factors which you see are material in nature. If you look at the annual reports of any company, you won't find these factors in the financial statements. But if these are ignored, these factors will have a huge bearing on the financial part of the company. If you look at this slide, you can see some of the news headlines over the last one month. ESG is definitely becoming a real deal. One of the landmark hearing, which happened just a month ago, was given by the Dutch court where it ordered the oil giant Shell to reduce its carbon emission. Why suddenly such kind of a regulation came through? It's because the time is running out. We have to stop putting responsibility on someone else to make the planet better. We have to take the lead. And that's what is happening all across the globe. And if the companies continue to be irresponsible towards the environment, and start exploiting the environment, then what will happen? There will be strikes, the projects will get stalled, and that eventually will result in losses and cost to the company. At the same time, if the company is taking its employees for granted, 
if they are compromising on the safety and health of the employees, that will eventually result in strikes, lockouts, bad reputation, even litigation, and eventually result into a huge cost to the company. So it's high time that we take ESG into mainstream. And we have seen in the past, there are numerous examples where there's some negative news and it's have reacted negative to such news. If you look at the recent example of JNK Bank, there have been lapses on governance. It, ha it happened that the former chairman started giving out loans in crores of rupees to people just because some politician has recommended it to an extent that he started diver diverting funds which are meant for CSR. And you can see clearly that the stock market has reacted. The price fell by 20% in a day. I can go on and on about different examples of governance where there have been some cutting of corners and the stock price has reacted. Another example is that of Vedanta, where the government banned the mine project in Odisha because it was affecting the tribal community and also disrupting the environment. And all of us have seen that the stock price fell by 66% not just in a day or two, but over two years of time. All these incidences just indicate that it's high time that we give importance to material factors and stop ignoring them because ultimately it is going to catch up and it is going to catch up financially. So what does ESG has to offer? ESG gives you an opportunity to invest in quality companies. It's a lens to identify companies which are future ready. It's a lens to see whether the company is innovative in managing its capital and thereby ensuring financial sustainability. And at the same time, these companies are taking care of environment and society. These companies are susceptible to lower risk and therefore ready to take on any disruptive change that can come in the future. But does that mean it comes at the cost of profit? Certainly not. There are a lot of academic studies which show that there is a strong positive correlation between sustainability and economic profit. What does that mean? In simple terms, it means that sustainability doesn't come at the cost of compromising profits. The studies have shown that because of sustainable practices, the company is able to manage its risk better, resulting into getting capital at a lower cost that eventually translates into better operational performance. And all these things are positive for the company's share price performance. So ESG or sustainable practices gives the company a higher probability to have higher profits and also ensure that there are lower tail risks. But all said and done, what is happening across the globe? Is ESG just a fad is it just a trend or a marketing gimmick? It's certainly not. The United Nations Principles of Responsible Investing is an entity where different entities sign up to park their uh, portfolios in a responsible manner. So the number of signatories under the UNPRI have grown significantly as much as 40 times over last decade. And if you look at the AUM growth, the pandemic has been the trigger and now the AUM growth has gone up from 6.5 trillion to 80 trillion as on 2020. Definitely, the pandemic has been an eye-opener and a push towards responsible investing. If we just look at the top league funds, one of the biggest funds on pension, that is the California pension funds in the US, which has trillions of dollars of AUM, is moving towards ESG. Not just that, even in the Europe or even in the Scandinavia, the Norges Bank, which manages the pension fund for the Norway, is moving towards ESG. The Swedish funds, the children's funds, you name it, and all of them are moving towards this fastest growing investment opportunity. And it's high time that we acknowledge that ESG is here to stay. 2020 for all of us has been extremely catastrophic because of the pandemic. And it has made us understand that we cannot take things for granted. 
We cannot take our immunity for granted and definitely we cannot take environment and society for granted. Right from government to different regulators all across the globe, from US to Europe to New Zealand, everybody is, is rolling out regulations to make sure that ESG gets a push. The regulations are in favor of making, uh, making disclosures better. The regulations are in favor of supporting investors to make a better choice by categorizing funds which are ESG focused. And what is happening in India? It's heartening to see that even the Indian regulation is catching up. Over the last decade, we have seen different policies have been rolled out in favor of corporate social responsibility, corporate governance, business responsibility, and even more recently for responsible investment. The latest 2020-21 regulation where SEBI mandated top 1,000 companies to have mandatory disclosures on business responsibility and sustainability is a game changer. This is a huge leap in the direction of responsible and sustainable investing. And this is going to be a huge decision maker for asset managers and for investors to look at ESG from a different lens. The the regulation basically looks at making sure that the disclosures on ESG are better, are consistent, and are more transparent. But all said and done, does this mean that ESG is really good? But what happens in, in reality? Does it really work? Let us look at this example. So we all know Mariko, and one of its popular product is the parachute hair oil. We tried to investigate how Mariko is adopting ESG. From the governance part, we found out that, gov that Mariko has a higher promoter shareholder, but it is professionally managed and the business is taken care by a professional CEO. Also, when we look at the independence of the board, more than 55% of the board members are independent. So that means that the board members are not some family or friends of the promoter, but it's purely independent. Also, the material which the, which the Mariko is using for producing its products is sourced from renewable sources. At the same time, Mariko is ensuring that whatever packaging material they are using is recyclable. So therefore, not just sourcing responsibility, but also disposing responsibly is what Mariko is doing. And at the same time, Mariko has identified this long before anybody else, that it's they have to uh, adhere to responsible sourcing guidelines and they have signed up for that in 2017 itself. And if you look at the performance, vis-a-vis -vis the peers, Mariko has done exceptionally well over the long period. But does this mean that Mariko is excellent and what about others? We also looked at broad indices. So if you look at the chart, there is MSCI India ESG Leaders Index, where that is, the, that is the line in blue, and the orange line is the MSCI India Index. The MSCI India ESG Leaders Index has companies which are doing extremely well on ESG. And if you look at the performance, it's very clear that the MSCI India ESG Leaders Index has performed exceptionally better as compared to the traditional broad-based index. And not just in case of performance, but when the years where the markets have fallen significantly, the ESG leaders index has fallen lesser as compared to the traditional index. So if you look at 2008 or 2011, the performance of the fund is negative, but it has fallen lesser as compared to the broad index. And the recent fall of 2020, you can see that the MSCI India ESG Leaders Index has able to recoup its losses faster as compared to the broad-based index. Similarly, if we compare the Nifty 100 ESG Tri Index versus the traditional Nifty 100 Index, you see that across the time period, the Nifty 100 ESG Index has performed exceptionally better as compared to the Nifty 100 Index. And the recent performance of 20 2020 is really impressive, where the Nifty 100 ESG index has exceptionally outperformed its broad-based peer. 
And it's important to note that the ESG index has quality names and therefore the volatility in the index as well as the volatility in the stock prices of the underlying stocks is lesser in case of ESG indices. Therefore, we can all agree that sustainability and profitability are complementary to each other. And therefore, it's important now to see whether the passive indices, how the passive indices are doing vis-a-vis -vis an active strategy. So Quantum India ESG equity fund is an active strategy where we are true to the ESG label. The weights in this strategy are reflection of the ESG scores that the companies give. Whereas if we look at passive indices, those are market cap based indices. Although the companies underlying in these indices are ESG companies, but it's important to see that actively managed fund does better, not only as compared to the Nifty 100 ESG index, but also vis-a-vis -vis the traditional broad based index. And the outperformance is not by a margin, but it has significantly outperformed over the entire time frame. With this, uh, I would now like to invite my colleague, Mr. Chirak Mehta, to explain to you the pitfalls of ESG investing and what is it that Quantum has to offer in terms of the ESG offering. Over to you, Chirak. Yeah, thank you, Sneha, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Like Sneha has explained that uh, we are all trying to become more sustainable and in, uh, that also extends to how we invest, right? We are trying to find out companies which will last longer and therefore they will compound longer in the long term. So, uh, so we are trying to find those quality businesses who will last cycles and cycles and get you that compounding in terms of uh, given their ability to fight competition, innovate, and therefore uh, not only looking at their own businesses, but staying ahead of the curve and looking at uh, what is their environmental footprint what is the impact they have on society? What are their governance standards? That is what we are looking at today, right? Uh, but it is not that simple, right? We have seen uh, evidence of ESG doing well, be it in an ESG company, be it in ESG indices, or be it in an ESG fund. All have done well, but uh, is there a catch here? Is it all hunky-dory or is, it, is, it, is there a risk also with ESG investing? Uh, what could go wrong is what we will see in the next few slides. So you have to be very, very careful. It is shown uh, it's metal. It is shown that it works, but what are the risks or what are the things that investors need to keep in mind is what we will see. Because ESG, which is environmental, social, and governance, a process to move towards sustainability can move easily into something like ESG. ESG is eyewash, hogwash, and greenwash, which will mean people may give you tall promises, People may say a very good things or glorious things in their reports or uh, whatever they come out with, uh, but at the end, it will just be an eyewash. It, internally, they might not be practicing so much as much as they are telling you the story, right? So uh, if you move on to the next slide, so uh, something we call as greenwashing, right? Uh, something the companies may uh, uh, make it appear that they are doing all the good things uh, when it comes to their business activities but in reality they're hiding something which you know is not so good for example if you look at a renewable power company when it comes to esg a renewable power company will always have a, a positive impact on the environment right uh, they will always be looked at favorably by esg uh, funds or ESG indices, but what really goes out of focus is, though they are positive on carbon emissions or pollution is lower in those companies, what it really masks is they need huge land to set up that renewable energy plant, right? And that plant may be forced acquired from people, right? There could be an impact on the local community, there could be protest, which can go unnoticed for a while, but eventually it may come to bite and therefore there can be a negative impact on the company, which you investors will have to bear the brunt if that is look, uh, not looked at uh, in, a, in, in, in your research, right? There are consumer appliances company, like say, for example, washing machine companies, refrigerator companies, those kind of companies, 
uh, you know, uh, people generally look at what is the emissions that they have when they manufacture those products. But at the same time, what is more critical is that they use and innovate their products such that the use phase emissions are much lower, right? Those companies will thrive. Right? They also have a producer, uh, extended producer responsibility in a way that uh, some, when someone wants to uh, dispose of those products, does the company take steps to help them dispose of not, right? We all know that the buyback schemes that company has or exchange uh, plans that they run, you know, uh, those are all extended producer responsibilities. So you need to have, look into those aspects, just not look at what are the kind of emissions that the company has when they make those products. Uh, fast fashion industry is very much into focus, like someone says, eco-friendly clothing or sustainable clothing. Uh, that is fair. Uh, that is needed, but many of uh, what gets unnoticed is they kind of exploit labor in poor uh, countries, be it India, be it Bangladesh, or be it Indonesia. Uh, so those are the things also need to be kept into account because that can really turn with the tide of regulation. A regulator may say that uh, you as a company, today you are making super normal profits, but at the same time, you have to also see that your supply chain is well catered too. Uh, when it comes to banking sector, there is a too much focus on the financial risk management, whether the company is going and expanding uh, uh, their horizon, going into rural areas, doing the financial inclusion activity or not. But at the same time, uh, uh, there is no integration when they lend uh, to, to corporates, right? They kind of not look, uh, look at uh, ESG risk, for example, they kind of uh, 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 they kind of lend to a mining company. They kind of lend to a, a power plant. What are the risks involved in that lending? That is more critical rather than looking at whether there is a financial risk management done or not, because these are very potential risk on environment and social side, and regulations are turning very very fast. So if the company is not looking at these risks then there is going to be certainly a problem in that company. So when it comes to ESG, uh, you have to look beyond optics, uh, beyond what the normal uh, practices of the company is and go into details in terms of what are the e, uh, ENS risk, environment and social risk, and the, is the company incorporating those risks in their business activities or not? If it is not, then it is complete greenwashing, right? Many investors, almost 44% of institutional investors are worried uh, that the company is not doing what it is claiming. So it is our role as fund managers uh, that we, our research is very, very solid and that they go uh, and do what they are saying and what they are claiming it to be. Going on to the next slide. Uh, So we saw uh, something like hog, uh, a green wash, right? There's something called hog wash and eye wash as well, which is just a marketing spin, which is just a PR activity that many of the companies do to showcase that they are, uh, they are complying with regulations, they are beyond regulations, that they are the best practices company out there, right? Uh, something like uh, there, is, there is a requirement of having an independent board, and it is very, very important to have an independent board. A majority of directors being independent, that is required because they kind of ensure that we all as minority shareholders are, are taken care of. They are, we are not uh, unfairly treated by the promoters of the majority shareholders, right? That's a task that the uh, independent board does. Uh, but many times to circumvent that, uh, many companies will appoint or many promoters will appoint friends and fam uh, relatives on the board and call them as independent. Uh, the question is, are they really independent? They are not, right? Uh, there is a requirement that, you know, independent uh, uh, audit committee and the remuneration committee be independent, which means that two third uh, of, their, of the directors, there are independent directors. But what happens is many times the promoters or, uh, uh, or, or, or the directors are kind of uh, the permanent invitees to that committee. That really dissolves the independence of those committees. So that is not really working in interest of all of us as shareholders, right? But that is completely an eyewash. Uh, there is a CSR spending requirement, uh, but we have seen that the true intention of the spending is not really met. Uh, we have seen like companies uh, donate to uh, uh, 
uh, they really donate to in, uh, educational institutions where people of the rich go or the elite class goes. Is that, is that really CSR? That's not CSR, right? That's a complete hogwash. And uh, we've seen so many instances where certain companies report a high sexual harassment case, or at some place, places they don't report or they report nil sexual harassment case. The idea is to find out what is real in terms of uh, whether the company has a policy that allows you or allows women uh, who have gone through the discrimination uh, to go and air their voice or not. Do they have that open policy or not? That is the need uh, when it comes to such kind of instances in a company. Reporting nil has to raise red flags and be a, uh, a, be a reason to inquire. So uh, we have to go beyond this greenwash, hogwash, and eyewash and get into the uh, uh, crux of the things to ensure that uh, we invest with the right companies who are doing the right things, right? So moving on. Uh, uh, if you see rating agencies, so you have credit rating agencies, you also have rating agencies on ESG who rate companies on how they good they are on ESG, right? We have seen credit rating agencies have always been behind the curve, uh, be it the 2000 global financial crisis, they couldn't pick up globally in the US market where that a mortgage crisis was unfolding. They couldn't, uh, in Indian markets, they couldn't uh, spot the island FS crisis the DHFL crisis, they haven't been able to spot. They have been sort of behind the curve. When it comes to ESG ratings, uh, you know, there is a, uh, there is a research paper that, that calls that aggregate confusion uh, because uh, uh, the correlation of ratings in a credit rating is around 0 0.9. So if you look at one rating agency vis-a-vis -vis the other, uh, they have similar kind of ratings for a company. But when it comes to ESG, that correlation drops down to around 0.6, which really tells you that uh, there is very two different perspectives that you get from various different ESG ratings. So in that sense, either of them is right for sure, but uh, is, are they reliable? Because there is so much dichotomy between them that you really don't know who is right or who is wrong. So that really brings you, because most of the indices use these rating agencies to kind of use, uh, uh, for their ESG indices. And therefore, uh, they may not be a, uh, uh, given, given the uh, differences that we are seeing in terms of opinion, which are bound to be uh, how much reliable they are. Or you should go on the active management side and say that, you know, that at least I can check with the fund manager uh, into terms of what they classify as ESG and not as ESG. And therefore, I can take a right call instead of going with the indices, right? So moving ahead uh, on the next slide. So if you look at ESG, it is very, very subjective. Like beauty, ESG lies in the eye of the beholder, right? Uh, we all want to move towards sustainability, beyond, towards responsible investing, and we know it's working well, right? So that is the promise of ESG. ESG is nothing but a process. It's a process of helping you move towards sustainability, uh, and currently, it is, it is very, very nascent. It will continue to evolve. There is no perfected science out there. So you as an investor, when you're going towards ESG, what are the things that you need to keep into account? Uh, you have to look at the greenwash, eyewash, hogwash. You have to see that there is difference of opinion given by the rating agencies. You have to look at the fund house pedigree. What have they believed in? What have they practiced so far? And should I... Uh, should I rely on them on choosing the right ESG companies for me? Do they look at uh, governance in detail? Because governance is very, very important because we believe if you not ha don't have good governance, you will surely skip out on some or the other matter of ENS. And therefore, uh, to have a holistic ESG approach, uh, there will be certain shortfalls or shortcomings that uh, uh, will not make it a true ESG company. So you have to look at the fund house in terms of their focus areas, whether they believe in governance and these traits of ESG or sustainable investing and responsible investing, or they kind of looking at growth and momentum and those kind of traits, right? You also look at ESG framework. What kind of framework do they have? And are they open to evolve this framework towards reaching uh, the right practices or not? 
so that is one more consideration you have to learn if you are uh, uh, if you are investing with a fund house to reach that sustainable investing or esg investing then you have to know what kind of process they follow and does that uh, uh, be in sync with your belief system and your value systems or not third important thing is you have to look at what is the quality and depth of research right uh, many of these rating agencies go more by disclosures of the companies uh, they kind of uh, 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 look at uh, what is uh, what is really uh, the crux of research that they have uh, uh, those are the funds that or those are the ratings agencies that you need to back with and go with those products because here the quality and depth is very very important given the greenwash eyewash hogwash that you can have from the companies uh, and therefore spotting this and going beyond the tree hugging logos or beyond the optics is very much required and therefore which fund house or which uh, funds research goes to that extent or goes to uh, ensure that what is claimed is really the thing or not and when you as an investor are going towards sustainable investing or esg investing you need to have a very long term approach it's not a 2 to 3 year thing it's it's at least a market cycle to reap the benefits of esg or sustainable investing why uh, if you have a good quality company right who is doing all the right things right uh, only in a good market or in a, in a bull market or in a a good cycle economic cycle all businesses will do well mostly right and uh, whenever there is a crisis or whenever there is a downturn in the economy that is where the survival of the fittest comes right uh, only those businesses that are able to kind of survive better in those cycles tend to have a, a good market share they have lesser competition and uh, they are able to have a pricing power which allows them to grow revenues so from that perspective only when a company sees a market cycle that is where the true traits of a good company comes into picture that is where the quality shines and that is where uh, you have to uh, give that much time for that company to prove its metal and therefore say that i am a good sustainable company and therefore now is my time to do well so if you are not looking at some uh, time horizon of at least a market cycle which is roughly 7 to 8 years then you should not go into esg kind of investing you need to have a long term approach when you move towards esg so moving on to the next slide uh, we will give you a, a thing that what we think what is our idea uh, what we think are important things that we have already discussed and we will discuss further and what investors need to look at when they choose an esg fund right so when it comes to an esg fund uh, the fund firstly has to be true to label esg should be the core of investment decision making if you look at many of the indices out there right what they do is uh, they will have a minimum esg threshold and beyond that what they will do there is some other thing that will decide how much portfolio allocation to have so they will decide on a universe that they want through esg scores that any company that uh, say satisfies a minimum threshold score will be part of my universe and now esg jobs job is over they will now rely on some other thing be it market cap or be it some other valuation metric to identify what is the uh, what is the weight that i can assign to that stock whereas what we think is the right thing to do is let if you are banking on sustainability as a driver of long term returns then esg has to do the heavy lifting esg has to be the core of investment decision making that decides what kind of allocation you assign to a stock right and that has to comprehend to the esg score that he has right second thing is uh, the in depth research and due diligence that the fund does uh, should be a priority the more in depth they are more they are doing verification around the claims of the companies that is the right way to go about do, uh, looking at an esg fund uh and whenever you get into look at companies right the given the development stage that india is uh there is a need for companies uh, a companies not cannot be 100 when you start it has to move towards that and what will take them towards that is the active management engagement by the fund manager the fund manager will continuously talk to companies 
ensure they are moving on the right path to improve not only the disclosures, but also their practices so that they become really more sustainable, their ESG practices improve, and that will reap further benefits going ahead. Uh, another thing that we have found a problem with uh, many of the ESG indices or the approaches of to ESG, they tend to be lopsided, right? To a particular sector or a theme, right? Uh, many of the ESG uh, indices we have seen are either lopsided towards IT sector or to a financial sector, given that these two sectors don't have much impact on the environmental footprint, and therefore they tend to have a overweight when it comes to their portfolio. So what we consciously think is that there is uh, there are good companies in each and every sector or in most sectors, and we need to find out leaders in most of these sectors, not forcibly, but if they are good at ESG, if you can find good companies out there, good quality companies, then you need to look at those sectors and have and try to choose leaders from those sectors. That is what ESG is all about, right? And at the same time, when you're looking at ESG, you need to ensure that these companies are financially stable. You don't want a company which is doing all the green things, but at the same time, does not have that balance sheet strength or the financial sustainability to last next few years at least, right? So you need to look at companies which are financially stable. You need to uh, look at companies that are financially sound. And by looking at ratios like what kind of balance sheet that they have, what kind of debt they have, what kind of capital efficiency that they have, you can easily identify the financial sustainability of these companies. And along with financial sustainability, if they are sustainable in their business practices, that's a win-win combination that you can have and build a portfolio around it. So these are the traits we think are very, very important. And that is what we have used to build our fund, the Quantum India ESG Equity Fund, right? So moving on, uh, when I spoke about uh, the fund house pedigree, uh, I will also want to tell you what Quantum stands for, right? Uh, ESG is not new for us. Since 1996, at the quantum group level, uh, when I say quantum group, there is a parent entity of the quantum mutual fund, which is quantum advisors that manages money for foreign institutional investors like pension funds, uh, university endowments, sovereign wealth funds uh, into Indian equities. And there, when we have a, a track record, uh, we have been using an integrity screen, which is nothing but a governance criteria, where which ensures that the minority shareholders like you and us, uh, uh, are not treated unfairly by the company or by the promoters of the company, right? That trade, along with not investing in sin stocks, when I say sin stocks, what I mean is not investing in, uh, uh, in alcohol, tobacco, gambling companies. Those are sin companies, and therefore we do not invest in that since the uh, beginning uh, of uh, our track record. So we have focused on extensively on governance as our criteria and also on certain social factors uh, we have kind of emphasized in our investment journey. When it came to 2015, we kind of sen got sensitized to the importance of environmental and social factors as well. So we kind of built our own team, uh, built our own proprietary rating methodology on evaluating companies on ESG. Uh, we have a current database of around 160 companies now on ESG. And when we were sure, uh, I mean, of, of a certain metric of how to evaluate companies on ESG, that is when we launched our fund uh, in 2019. So it is completely based on a, our proprietary ESG rating methodology. We do not use outside research on ESG. Uh, and, and that we believe gives us an edge our journey of using, looking at ESG traits all, all across and our own proprietary uh, method going through a learning curve. I think that really gives us an edge on evaluating companies on ESG. So moving on uh, the next slide. So what is our approach? When it comes to looking at companies, we look at material issues that impact that company, right? Uh, say for example, uh, if it is a if it is a uh, manufacturing company, then the environment aspects are very very important, and we kind of subjectively assess all, but we lay uh, significant uh, uh, importance 
on the material issues which have a bearing on the business activities of that company. Second thing, governance plays a very important role. It sits at our heart at our analysis. It gets a very high weight. It gets a 50% weight in our evaluation of ESNG. Uh, we look at uh, uh, typical areas of focus, our capital allocation decisions. What is the board composition? Because the board and management are very, very important because those are the ones that take all the calls of or decisions of what the company will do going ahead. What are the quality of disclosures that they have? Uh, we subjectively assess each and every disclosure. And we look at how the company look, treats the minority shareholders. Is there, uh, is there an uh, uh, event where the company has treated minority shareholders differently from the promoters? If that is the case, then you need to be wary of such companies. And we always always seen that you know if there are shortcomings on environmental and social uh, aspects of that company, it could be a proxy for wider problems that can come in the company. If the company doesn't take its social license to operate as granted and takes the environment and society for granted, then there is going to be some or the other blow up in the company going ahead. So you need to take how the company treats not only the governance, but also the social and environmental aspects of its business activity. In total, what are we trying to find out is companies that can act as long-term stewards of capital. Which company will kind of uh, innovate, survive, and kind of compound over uh, the long run? That is the kind of company we are trying to find out through our ESG process. Next slide. So uh, when it comes to our approach, how do we kind of rank companies or score companies? So we look at various data sources, not only the reports that the companies come out with or not only the data points that company releases, we kind of try to gather information from various different sources, uh, be it unconventional sources like the pollution control boards, be it industry association reports, be it our interactions with the companies, right? Uh, we kind of try and score companies, uh, we look, give a 30% weighted to the disclosures, and we kind of critically evaluate each and every disclosure, which gets a 70% weight. And doing all this, we kind of come to a score of that company, which ranges from a plus 30 to minus 70. And any company that scores above zero in that, from minus 70 to plus 30, anything above zero, will kind of be eligible to be part of our ESG universe, and therefore can be part of, of our portfolio. On the next slide, uh, what is more important here is not to just rely on the company disclosures. So what do we do to identify that greenwashing, bug washing, and uh, eye washing that the company can intend to do? Because there are incentives. If you look at the global capital, as uh, Sneha pointed out, there is a lot of capital moving into sustainable investing, responsible investing, ESG investing. And therefore, there are enough incentives for the company to kind of claim even if they are not doing those things. So we have to be very, very uh, conscious of that fact. We have to verify what the company says and do thus is, is uh, real or not. And therefore, we kind of visit the plants, factories of the companies, try to speak to various stakeholders, be it uh, employees, be it suppliers, be it customers, be it regulators, or be it the industry associations, to try to identify if, the comp if there are any, any things that can get highlighted, which can become a reason for our inquiry and which we can dig into deeper and, and try to ensure that you know, the company is doing or claiming is real or not, right? So we also map each and every company vis-a-vis -vis its peers, right? So if you have one criteria against which you're measuring the company, and if you put that criteria against uh, various companies in that sector, or be it the global companies in that sector, you will come to know whether you know some some number is going out of whack, right? It's extreme, and therefore that really tells you at least that you have to see or evaluate this number very very carefully. This will give. This is what allows us. This comparison allows us to kind of make that re inquiry with the company, check, ask those hard questions to the companies, and get the right answers and therefore evaluate. So uh, ESG is not tick the box research. It is not desk research. You have to go beyond to be able to identify the true sustainable companies. Uh, going ahead uh, on the next slide. 
uh, how we build, this was our ESG process. How do we go about building our portfolio? Uh, we do lay an emphasis on liquidity because we want to have a scalable portfolio. We are, are uh, if you look at our portfolio capacity, though we are around uh, 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 45 crores right now, our size can be expanded to about 21,000 crores without us changing any of the portfolio characteristics or any way in which we invest today. So the portfolio is very, very scalable. And what allows us that scale is our emphasis on liquidity. We buy companies only which, are, uh, which trade about a million dollars a day over last 12 months or over last one year. Uh, and that gives us that liquidity to kind of have a capacity which can uh, go beyond. Uh, so if you look at the Indian stock market landscape, stocks that qualify that million dollar criteria, liquidity criteria is 450 plus stocks. Uh, we kind of qualitatively assess our research has reached about 160 stocks from that 450 stocks today. Uh, from that 450, uh, 160 stocks, all the stocks that qualify for the positive ESG score are eligible to be part of the portfolio. And we intend to build a portfolio of that positive ESG scores, which ranges from 40 to 60 stocks. So today, if you look at the portfolio, there are 48 names in the portfolio, and we intend to build a portfolio of 40 to 60 stocks. Uh, going ahead, next slide. Uh, so uh, as I said, uh, any, any stock that has uh, a positive ESG score, and we can at least mold it based on that score that it has. Uh, if we can mold it at least a half a percent weight, that, that company will come to the portfolio. Uh, and we have certain sector guard deals to ensure that the portfolio doesn't become lopsided. The idea is to get leaders from various sectors, and there are good companies within each sector that we can rely on or we can call them sustainable, and therefore build a more holistic portfolio, which is very well diversified of good ESG companies. And uh, apart from those sector guardrails, we had stock level limits as well. A minimum that we'll buy at a stock is minimum 1% at cost and maximum will go at a stock level is 5%. Why only 5%? Because we do not look at valuation of the company, though we look at financial soundness, financial stability of that company, but we don't really look at PE ratios or price to book or those kind of metrics. Uh, we are banking on sustainability of companies and therefore to avoid any short-term cyclicality of any particular stock or sector, we kind of cap each and every stock at maximum 5% allocation at cost. Maximum at market value, we can go up to 10%, but uh, this is done to ensure that we have a well-diversified portfolio, no reliance on any particular stock. And, and this is how we go about building the portfolio. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, so you as an investor, what you will own when you come in the Quantum India ESG Equity Fund is uh, our stock selection is value agnostic, banking on ESG and financial stability of those companies. Uh, why uh, value agnostic should not be a reason uh, to worry because if you look at most stock indexes are value agnostic, plus they don't look at governance or ENS aspects. We are looking at financial stability. We are looking at ESG traits. Uh, so in turn, we kind of uh, get companies which have uh, kind of provide exposure to a quality and low volatility factors, which kind of does well in the down market. So if you look at us fund managers, you know, when markets are really getting frothy, expensive, what are they doing? They are kind of moving at that point in time to quality stocks. ESG portfolios are itself quality stocks, and therefore they kind of, uh, have flows coming in from many various other managers during such kind of markets, and therefore they do well in down markets. Given that these are sustainable companies, they are going uh, not only adhering to regulations in kind of uh, letter, but also in spirit. Uh, they tend to have are beyond regulations. They innovate. Uh, they kind of take care of all stakeholders, and therefore tail risk are lower in these companies. And they tend to deliver long-term better risk-adjusted returns. So this is what you can expect when you're coming in an ESG fund. But at the same time, please ensure that you're coming in for the long haul because ESG is not short-term investing. It is very, very long-term investing. And that is when you can really reap the benefits of ESG investing. 
uh, going to the next slide. So uh, ESG investing is about uh, what we were all searching for, the triple bottom line, right? Something that is good for the planet, something that is good for people, and something that is good for profits you, for you as an investor. So ESG, environment for planet, social for people, and uh, governance for profits. So that is what ESG aims to achieve. Next slide. Next slide, please. So if you look at the track record, uh, uh, ESG or since our inception has done better, not only against the ESG indexes, but against the normal stock market indexes like BSC 30 or Nifty 50, it has done much better than those cap weighted indexes. So here you not, not, don't only get a portfolio which is outperformed, but uh, if you look at the track record per se, it's been less than two years of track record. But if you look at the market, it has gone through a cycle of its own, right? Uh, because of COVID markets fell sharply and then it rebounded very sharply after that and it continues that momentum. But even in both the phases of market in a down cycle and in an up cycle, uh, both the phases we saw this outperformance. So that really tells us that ESG is working well, right? And over, over the time period, it has a good outperformance over, over not only ESG indexes, but even the normal traditional cap weighted indexes that kind of gives you an evidence that ESG, our process is working well for us. Next slide. So that was only about the returns. The uh, other side of that coin is the risk, right? Uh, though standard deviation is not a measure of risk, it does give you what kind of volatility ups and downs you can see uh, from the investment that you're making, right? So if you look at uh, not only it kind of outperformed, but it also has lower volatility. Uh, if you look at the Quantum India ESG fund has about 20.7% standard deviation, whereas others are upwards of 24% standard deviation, which tells you that there is lower volatility out there. Also, when markets fell uh, during the COVID crash, it fell by about 33%, whereas most other indices fell by about 37, 38%. So it fell lesser, it rose higher, and the volatility has been lower. Next slide. And if you look at the portfolio, you will have uh, across sectors uh, uh, exposure, consumer discretionary being a very high weight, uh, followed by second by IT, financials, materials, staples. But you will see uh, most of the sectors we have exposure to within the portfolio, right? And also, if you look at uh, the, the top names, uh, uh, they are, they are well-renowned names, and you can acknowledge that they are good ESG companies, be it TCS, Infosys, HDFC, Webco, Tata Motors. And also, if you look at the bottom five, which are very, very different portfolio out there, which is Morico, Tata Consumer Products, Tata Communication, HDFC Bank, and Havels, much of these, uh, the bottom five of the, the top 10 uh, is, is usually very unique to portfolio that you will see. Uh, so top 10 allocation, again, very, very diversified, just 35% of the portfolio, making an average rate of 3.5%. Uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, if you look at uh, the, the PE ratio, it vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis BSC 30, uh, it tends to be looking at the tra trailing 12-month PE. It is slightly expensive portfolio, given it's a quality portfolio, it's slightly expensive than the, uh, but the kind of quality that we have, it doesn't come at an exorbitant premium. And also, if you look at the weighted earnings growth going forward, what the consensus estimates have, have uh, estimated as, uh, is uh, about 28% growth for the Q ESG portfolio two year out versus 23% for the BSC 30. So uh, at, at current, it may look a tad expensive, but it is more than made up by the earnings growth potential that it has. And therefore the peg ratio, which is PE uh, per unit of growth uh, is lower saying that uh, from, if adjusted for growth, the PE is lower for QESG as compared to the BSG 30 index. On the next slide. So when it comes to ESG, uh, what kind of allocation you can have from your portfolio? We will still suggest that you have a diversified allocation to equities uh, because you don't know when and, uh, when and what period or what cycle which style will do better. 
and therefore having the diversification is very very essential so uh, equity fund of funds which gives you a very diversified basket uh, is our bigger allocation at 60% allocation of your equity capital uh, when it comes to our value strategies is 20% and when it comes to our esg we also say it should be 20% of your allocation now why not more why only 20% uh, esg if you look is an evolving uh, evolving aspect, right? It will continue to evolve uh, and aim towards further looking at getting the right kind of sustainability uh, companies within its ambit, right? Uh, it, is, it is still very, very nascent. It's been few years. Uh, it will continue to evolve, not only in terms of practices or disclosures for companies, but also their practices. And therefore, uh, you need to have a uh, allocation which is not significantly higher. Therefore, 15 to 20 percent of your portfolio, which is what we can recommend. Uh, and and uh, as evidence grows that ESG is working well as it continues to evolve, that is the time you can have a little higher allocation than the 20 percent. But right now, we will suggest that you know uh, you ha have a uh, allocation of somewhere between 15 to 20 percent of your portfolio to ESG, and that is what we we'll recommend. And at the end, have a diversified allocation within your equity allocations as well. So uh, I will leave you with the thought that uh, investing money and making a difference uh, is not two complementary things. Uh, you shouldn't have to pick between the two. And ESG does give you that opportunity. ESG ensures that investing money and making a difference can go hand in hand. And therefore, if you believe in this, then you can move towards ESG investing uh, uh, and, and, and adopt that as, as a core of your portfolio. Uh, with that, thank you so much. And uh, Sneha and I will be very happy to get your questions and answer them. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chirag and Sneha. That was a very insightful presentation. And now we'll begin the Q&A session. So we've already received a couple of questions in the Q&A chat box but I request all the remaining participants who have any more questions, please do send them through. So Chirag, the first question is for you. It looks like ESG is the future of investing. How much of an investor's portfolio should be allocated to ESG? And is this the right time to enter the market to invest in an ESG fund? Uh, yes. So. Uh... There are many parts to this question, actually. Uh, so yes, ESG will continue to become mainstream. If you look at uh, regulations that the way are shaping up in uh, foreign markets, be it Europe or be it US, uh, of course, Europe has been at the forefront of this. Uh, there have been court orders that have come to light, which kind of enforce companies to ensure that their environmental footprint uh, kind of doesn't blow out. Uh, that they are on a part to reduce their environmental footprint. So yes, uh, regulations are rapidly moving towards better ESG practices, better sustainable practices. Uh, and over a period of time, I think ESG investing as it evolves will kind of become mainstream. Uh, so, uh, so I think this is, uh, uh, this is kind of time where you can get into ESG investing uh, but as I have said, it kind of continues to evolve and will keep evolving, uh, not only in terms of disclosures, practices, the way kind of we approach the portfolio and research. Uh, so at this point in time, we'll recommend just about a 20% allocation of your equity capital to ESG uh, investing. Uh, and as the evidence grows, you could, uh, you could then increase it going forward. Uh, when it comes to, is this being the right time? So it depends on your equity allocation, uh, but given the way markets are expensive right now, uh, you could have a staggered approach towards investing towards equities and therefore ESG equities as well. So you could kind of allocate over next. Uh, uh, there, there are there's some uncertainties out there, right? We don't know if there will be a third wave of COVID or how severe that wave is going to be. If that doesn't pan out, uh, we are in a, to a cyclical recovery kind of phase. Uh, in, in Indian economy. So over a, a two, three year, five year period, things look much better and we are kind of headed towards a, a slightly better growth environment as such. But there could be kind of risk, which is in terms of, you know, uh, if there will be a third wave, it will have an impact 
or how severe or how light or it's going to be, it will also have its own impact on, on, on the economy. Uh, so at this point in time, if there are, uh, you know, pockets of opportunities that come across, you could increase your allocation or better be have a staggered approach to kind of uh, allocate over uh, through SIPs uh, over next 12, 15, 18 months to equities. So that is what approach you can have. But uh, we, in terms of ESG investing, I think this is uh, time that we begin ESG investing and adopt it because I think uh, over or next few years, it will become uh, more mainstream. Thanks, Chirag. So a follow-up question um, to that is that um, you had mentioned that now is the right time. So given that the markets are at an all-time high, should an investor invest in an ESG product now or should they wait for a correction or a crash to make use of that opportunity to enter at a lower cost? Yeah, I agree that markets are a tad expensive, uh, but we are in, in earnings up cycle as well. So it will depend if there are risks that emanate from uh, unknowns like the COVID third wave. Uh, but uh, if that doesn't happen, if that is a lighter one, uh, we will see some earnings uh, uh, come through and economic pickup for the growth momentum. So, uh, so I think uh, given the unknowns, it will be better to do a staggered approach uh, we don't know uh, to what extent there will be impact uh, because it's it remains an unknown. Uh, so uh, maybe allocate over 12, 18 months uh, in a staggered manner or use any corrections that you see as an opportunity to enter. Uh, you could have either of these approaches, uh, but within if you are going to allocate to equities, you could kind of uh, look at ESG investing uh, because even if there is a correction, uh, it, it might be that given the quality portfolio, it, uh, the bend towards quality has, it might fall lesser. So, uh, so the best thing is to have a staggered approach. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Chira. So Sneha, the next question is for you. How many companies are there in the small and mid cap range, which are following ESG norms? And is it safe to say and assume that large cap companies will be the only ones that are able to comply with the ESG norms? Uh, that's a very interesting question, Diana. Uh, so in terms of uh, the Quantum India ESG equity portfolio, uh, it's uh, it has a higher allocation to large cap companies, but uh, uh, it's important to note that we are not a cap-based fund. It's diversified across market caps. Uh, currently, we have around 70% allocation to large caps and 30% distributed between mid and small cap companies. And uh, as I mentioned that the regulation is coming through and top thousand companies are now mandated to have disclosures on business responsibility and sustainability, we can see that more and more companies will come under the coverage of ESG and we'll have better exposure in terms of having mid cap and small cap companies in the portfolio. Thanks. Raina, I, I may just add here, uh, you know, uh, in our experience or last few years, when we have been looking at uh, ESG practice of companies, we have come across uh, many good mid and small cap companies as well who have very good practices on ESG. So it all uh, goes boils down to what kind of uh, uh, belief system you have, what kind of value system you have, uh, what kind of ethics you have, and that will make you a good or bad ESG company. So, uh, so to our surprise, there have been many in that sector. And if you look at our allocation, we have about 20 to 23 percent allocation to mid and small cap segment as well. Okay, great. So related to that is um, which sectors are included in the QESG portfolio? And is there any allocation to pharma or chemical companies? Sneha Chirag, either of you can answer this. Yeah, I'll take this. Um, so uh, the allocation is there to all the sectors. Uh, we are not uh, focusing on one particular sector as such. Uh, so there is a diversification across all sectors and uh, we do have allocations to pharma as well as chemical companies, uh, uh, which are there in the portfolio. So among the 48 companies, I think we will have uh, allocation to at least one pharma company as well as uh, a couple of chemical needs. Yeah, just to add, uh, we are not biased towards any particular sector. 
Uh, many of the pharma companies don't have great disclosures today, so there is not much information that we have to evaluate them. Uh, given that regulations are mandating over a period of time to have uh, better disclosures, so we will have uh, better disclosures once we have that. Uh, we will have more names in that uh, portfolio, but on the chemical side, uh, we do have uh, three companies in that sector. Uh, and uh, if you look at the practices of those companies, they have excellent practices uh, uh, when it comes to their ESG uh, footprints. Uh, so we do have three uh, chemical companies in the portfolio. Okay. Okay. So uh, Chirag, you had mentioned that Quantum started the ESG screening process in 1996. So can you elaborate a little more on the screening and scoring process and is health and safety a form of criteria in the evaluation? And there's one more part where the investor wants to know if all the evaluation is only done by quantum or do we approach a uh, outsource a external evaluator? Yeah, sure. Uh, so just to give you a glimpse of our journey uh, towards CSG, uh, in 1996, we started something like what an in, is an integrity screen. And that focused largely on whether a company uh, differentiates between the shareholders, which means that whether the promoters are uh, treated differently as compared to the minority shareholders, which we all were, right? So uh, if the company treats them at par fairly, then those kind of companies will kind of uh, uh, pass our muster. And second thing that we looked at in the integrity screen is the ethics of the company, the business practices that it will have. Uh, so those were the things that we evaluated along with certain social factors, like how is the company uh, treating its employees or how is the overall behavior, social behavior of that company? Is it taking the social license to operate uh, as granted or it does kind of uh, 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 respects the society as well? So those are the traits that we looked at when we had the integrity screen, which we kind of practiced from 1996 as a group till 2015. In 2015, we kind of incorporated or had a holistic approach to look at not only that integrity screen, but overall governance of that company and also evaluation of the board, the management, uh, uh, the traits behind the management of the company in terms of uh, independent directors, uh, independence of remuneration and audit committees, uh, those kind of things. and. We also incorporated how does the company rank as far as its business practices is concerned on the environmental footprint, on the pollution, on the waste management, on the water uh, stewardship, those kind of things that we took into account. And also the social factors, where, uh, where uh, how does it kind of uh, behave uh, or, or does how does it incorporate or respect all the other stakeholders that it touches be it employees, be it uh, shareholders, be it uh, uh, vendors, suppliers, uh, customers, overall, how, how, what kind of approach that the company has uh, vis-a-vis all these share, uh, stakeholders. That is what we started evaluating in 2015 and had our own framework of evaluating. Uh, so, so we kind of approached uh, many of the rating providers to see if we can use their research but when we looked at their research, uh, there were companies that we kind of rated very poorly on governance aspects. Those had very high ratings, ESG ratings by these various third party providers. And that is where we decided that we need to have our own proprietary research to evaluate companies on ESG. And that is where we started beginning our journey, we went through a learning curve and established our own proprietary process. And we just rely on our, our own research, own process, and we do not rely on any third party research for uh, evaluating companies on ESG. Thanks for that, Chirag. So the next question for you is, why is it that Quantum ESG Fund didn't gather or garner higher AUM, even though Quantum was the first of the block in this category? And many fund houses that have entered after quantum in the ESG space have accumulated larger AUM. Yeah, that's that's right. Uh, I mean, despite our uh, superior track record that we have, uh, we believe our uh, process is even superior, uh, and that is reflected in the performance that we have vis-a-vis -vis the peer group. Uh, but unfortunately, 
I mean, we believe that we are asset managers and not asset gatherers. We are not aggressive marketers. Uh, we believe that people will look at our track record and come to us rather than we selling the fund to them. And therefore, if you look at uh, our track records across funds, they have been better, but uh, we haven't been able to reach the size that our peer groups have had. Uh, but eventually, I think if we stick to our basics, keep doing the right thing for investors, eventually we'll get the size uh, that we should command uh, basis the process and the track record that we have. So hopefully over a period of time, we will reach that. Great. So Sneha, next question for you. Can you tell us if QESG, that's a quantum ESG fund, follows a value or growth style of investing, how long should an investor remain invested in the ESG fund for? And can you also explain the taxation of the fund? Yeah, thanks, Raina. Um, so in terms of following a value style or a growth style, the fund is value agnostic. Uh, like Chirag has mentioned in the PPT that uh, we do not follow PE or any kind of valuation mid-rises. We purely base our fund decisions based on the ESG scores that the company gets. So uh, it's, it's I would call it a growth-oriented fund. Uh, in terms of coming to the taxation, the fund has uh, equity-oriented taxation uh, and uh, in, uh, similar to what any other equity scheme will have. And uh, in terms of uh, knowing how long you should be in the fund, uh, so ESG is something which uh, you, know, you shouldn't aim at uh, investing for a very short period. It is something which, uh, will, uh, which is going to work and uh, we have the evidence that it has worked over a long period. So definitely I would encourage investors to be there for the long period. Thanks. So related to this, again, either of you can take the question. What would be the long-term expected CAGR of QESG? And can an investor remain invested in this for long-term financial goals like child's marriage or retirement? Yeah, I'll, I'll take it. Uh, so I think we encourage that it is meant for long-term and you will really reap the benefits of ESG investing or sustainable investing over the long run only. So at least a market cycle. Why a market cycle? Uh, because, you know, uh, uh, whenever there is a downturn in the economy, that is when the good companies will survive. Uh, they will kind of uh, uh, showcase that they are truly sustainable. They will survive that crisis period. They will innovate. Uh, they will kind of uh, 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 ensure that uh, as they survive, uh, they will kind of get that market share uh, and therefore uh, reap more benefits or more revenues uh, and therefore be more profitable, uh, which will re showcase in their share prices. So if you really want to look at uh, uh, reap the benefits of uh, ESG investing, I will say at least a market cycle. And if there are multiple market cycles or business cycles or economic cycles that it goes through, then more the benefits that you'll reap. So I think it is an ideal to be core part of a portfolio and mainly for your long-term investing needs like be it uh, retirement planning or be it child education, those very long-term goals, I think it can really become a part of it. And Chirag, with regards to a estimated or predicted CAGR for long-term investments and what will be the minimum long-term period for achieving this level of CAGR? Yeah, so I think these are good sustainable companies overall. And uh, uh, our sense is that given there's a good quality companies over cycles, they will do much better than normal companies. Uh, and therefore, uh, if you were to look at over and above an index, uh, they should really outperform. Uh, if you give eight, 10 years uh, of time horizon, they will really outperform uh, uh, these traditional stock market indexes, be it BSC 30 or be it Nifty 50. Uh, because these are superior companies, according to us, because they go beyond their traditional remit, and uh, they they kind of have a have a culture that innovates. Uh, there is trust, and therefore uh, these companies really tend to uh, do well in the long run. So, uh, I, as stock markets will uh, will kind of uh, reflect the earnings of the companies, these tend to become. Uh, earnings, uh, their earnings will tend to increase over cycles and therefore uh, uh, they will benefit. So there is no estimate of what percentage points, but I think uh, my sense is that over a seven to 10 year horizon, they will definitely beat the traditional cap market indexes. 
Okay. Thanks, Chirag. So next question for Chirag is, has COVID-19 impacted the changing ESG investing landscape? And how are companies focusing on improving their ESG criteria amidst this pandemic? Yeah. So I think uh, pandemic has been really been a catalyst uh, to uh, increase the acceptance of ESG or sustainability. Uh, we have all seen that, you know, uh, we cannot take things for granted. You don't know uh, where is the crisis lurking from. Uh, there could be environmental, uh, because if you look at many of the scientists, the way they predict that we are moving towards, uh, towards an era or, or a period of where we, will, uh, uh, we are doing an irreversible damage to, to climate. So uh, there will be no point where we will be able to trade back. Uh, uh, it, it will have its consequences on many things, be it right from agriculture, be it from manufacturing, the way we have built cities, all will get impacted. Uh, and therefore, uh, it has become very, very important uh, to look at the environmental footprints, the way we kind of uh, have various practices. Uh, and and uh, those practices cannot continue for long. Secondly, it has also put into uh, 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 highlight the social aspects, how the company kind of uh, uh, takes care of its employees. That has become very, very important because uh, uh, the employees are ones that have been truly been impacted. And all the companies who have taken care of their employees have been able to work seamlessly uh, even in this crisis. So, uh, so in a way, uh, it has highlighted a lot of things and it has accelerated the adoption of ESG or sustainable investing. Uh, we are seeing uh, uh, globally, even investors have started taking it significantly, uh, giving significant importance to ESG trades. Uh, many of the investors have pledged that incrementally more and more of their investments will reflect ESG. So overall adoption by governments, by regulators, by investors, by companies, by consumers, all have increased because of this pandemic. And it has really accelerated the adoption of ESG. Thanks, Chirag. So next question is for Sneha. How do we ensure ESG investing is not a bubble? Do you think ESG challenges are going to grow in the long term? Uh, yes, definitely it's not a bubble or it's uh, something like a marketing gimmick. Uh, it's here to stay. Uh, e even, uh, uh, you know, even it has been ingrained into our education system now. Uh, children are even aware of the environmental impact, the social impact uh, that, is, uh, we, that is there because of the businesses or because of uh, human action. Uh, so uh, it's a matter of time that uh, the investors uh, will start uh, you know, voting with their uh, money and they'll start uh, making investments uh, uh, you know, by sticking uh, to their principles and by... Uh, focusing on ESG. So definitely ESG is something which is becoming mainstream and it's not something uh, which is like a short term uh, trend. Uh, and uh, the second question, uh, can you repeat it? Yes, sure. Uh, and any challenges that you assume or predict that uh, ESG investing is going to face in the long term? Uh, yeah, in terms of uh, challenges, uh, so there will be uh, challenges when it comes to standardization of ESG disclosures. So currently there, are, there is no uh, generic standard like we have in case of financial disclosures. Uh, so the bigger challenge is aligning uh, ourselves to the global uh, standard, uh, global reporting practices. That That is one of the bigger things that uh, currently everybody is focusing on and uh, uh, with the with the crisis uh, like uh, like the really bad for uh, the companies have to be much more uh, cautious in terms of having their ESG policies and uh, make sure that uh, you know they are geared up to face any kind of challenge that comes through thanks neha so Chirag, next question is, um, 
will India introduce enough regulations to support ESG practices? And how do you um, estimate AMFI and SEBI to also help with this new movement? So I think regulators are aware and they are doing a lot of work on ESG. Uh, if you look at the current disclosure standards that they've set uh, are very, very uh, detailed, uh, which will allow us to do uh, uh, our analysis very, very uh, efficiently. Uh, the new business responsibility sustainability report that the uh, uh, guidelines that the SEBI has come across, come out with, which mandates top thousand companies from next year to come uh, uh, to disclose all that data is very, very uh, beneficial. It will only increase adoption of ESG. And they are not only stopping at that. Uh, we are kind of liaising with the regulators. And uh, given that they have already just come out with in, in the month of May, they have come out with those regulations or that format of disclosures. They have already started reviewing the uh, uh, disclosure standards and see how they can improve it. So I think the regulators are moving very, very rapidly. And I think there will be a lot of support from the regulators to push the envelope uh, uh, towards ESG investing in a very big way. If you look at uh, India as, as, a, as a country, uh, there are various uh, sustainable development goals or various uh, uh, things that could improve in India, right from poverty to literacy to uh, agriculture, et cetera. There are a lot of goals that can be met and all this will require a lot of capital. And that capital India doesn't have, it has to come from offshore, right? If, if we have to attract capital from offshore to meet all these goals that we have, uh, which are called sustainable development goals, uh, uh, India will have to get its act together have not only great disclosures, but great practices to attract that capital. And uh, uh, so India has the capital. Uh, there is world willing to give that capital. Uh, India needs the capital. There is world uh, ready to give that capital. And that gap can be bridged only by way of adequate disclosures, good practices, improving practices. So I think uh, the government, the regulators are well aware of, the, of that fact. And I think all are working full time to ensuring that we move on the right path. Okay. This is one of the last questions. Um, I'm addressing it to either of you. What will cause good ESG companies to shine, especially during tough times? Or rather, how will ESG compliant companies have an advantage during unfavorable macroeconomic circumstances? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll take it. Uh, Sneha, you can add uh, further. Uh, so we have seen the traits of good ESG companies or uh, uh, sustainable companies is, you know, they are prepared uh, on, at all times. They are kind of uh, ahead of the curve. Uh, they are innovative. Uh, there is a culture within the organization that can kind of uh, uh, builds that innovation and fosters trust. Uh, they go beyond their traditional remit and ensure that all stakeholders are taken care of. Uh, so there is enough support that these companies get to survive the hard periods. And we have seen that, you know, uh, even they are, uh, they are prepared for that rainy day, even though they are innovating, they're doing much more than what competition is doing. Uh, they are well aware of that fact. And at the same time, they remain competitive. So, uh, so that really gives them an edge. Even during tough times, they are able to uh, uh, survive. And when the up cycle comes, we have seen that these companies, uh, because of less competition, get market share and a pricing power. And that is how uh, these companies uh, uh, do well over a cycle, at, or at least when that bad phase is out. And that is why we suggest that, you know, at least over a cycle, uh, these companies will be uh, able to make a difference. Uh, so, you, uh, uh, so this is how we have seen that, you know, the traits of these companies help them uh, to not only survive, but at least also thrive during the next phase of growth. Uh, so, so we are confident that these companies, given that uh, extent that they go uh, towards uh, improving their business practices, uh, they become more efficient in that process uh, because they have to uh, be ahead of competition while they do various different things, which the competition isn't doing. So, uh, so that, that gives them an edge overall. Uh, 
Sneha, you want to add anything? Yeah, just uh, just wanted to add one point to uh, what Chirag said. So these companies are basically uh, companies which are intelligent. They are, uh, these are the companies which adapt and these are the companies which are ready for any kind of disruptive change that comes. And the most important part of uh, a company being ESG compliant is that if you look at the company's uh, trajectory, even if it falls during the down market, these are the companies which are able to move very fast and recoup all their losses as compared to their other peers. So uh, definitely uh, quality is going to work uh, over above everything else. Thanks, thanks Triag and Sneha. There's actually one more question which can be clubbed with your closing remarks. It's, um, it's from an investor who wants to know that if the quantum ESG score is so thorough and promotes sustainable investing, why is it only applied to one scheme which is the QESG? Why don't other equity funds of quantum, like the long-term equity fund, equity funder funds, or ELSS follow the same thing? Why isn't it used as an overall investment philosophy and scoring criteria with equal weightage? The investor knows that we do use this as a criteria, but why not? Why, why don't we pay as much emphasis on this across all schemes rather than just on ESG? Um, yeah, I'm going to leave that thought with both of you. Sure. Uh... So I think ESG uh, is still evolving and will continue to evolve. Uh, the kind of investing that the value team does uh, is, is picking stocks which are value in nature and they have built a track record uh, based on that. Uh, so probably uh, over a period of time, they may integrate ESG trades, uh, but given that the track record that they have is based on uh, a stock picking based on a certain style, uh, uh, and that is what investors have learned and invested in that fund. Uh, it, it may not be uh, good to change the characteristics or traits, even when something that you're adopting is still evolving. So, uh, so only future will decide uh, and they will have to take a call whether they will integrate ESG traits within their value strategy. But uh, at this juncture, it may be a little uh, early to adopt or integrate that within, within their style. Uh, within the equity fund of funds, uh, we rely on external fund managers to kind of, uh, you know, uh, give that diversified basket of uh, investments to investors. And uh, therefore, it is not in our hands to kind of uh, have them adopt ESG principles. And that is also having a different kind of style of investing. So uh, given it's still too early days to integrate ESG with any other style, uh, and that is why we only recommend 15 to 20% exposure of your equity capital to ESG, given that it's evolving. Uh, so, uh, so at this point in time, it will be uh, it will be good to just stick with that and uh, let other styles, which are proven strategies, to do what they are good at doing, and not uh, really mix up while it still evolves. Uh, so that is a bit a bit thing. But over a period of time, my sense is that ESG will kind of become mainstream. It will get integrated in many of the investment strategies, uh, but uh, I don't think it, I think it is a little early before we reach that stage. Uh, uh, so, so, uh, so that is the future, but now I think uh, you can start allocating to ESG, make it a core allocation of your long-term equity capital or equity investments. Uh, and I think ESG, uh, uh, is, is a great way to invest uh, where your value and belief systems are. It allows you to vote with your wallet. And I think you should start adopting and make a move towards sustainable investing. Thanks to Rag. Sneha, would you want to add anything as part of your closing comments? Uh, yeah, just, uh, just uh, uh, it's, it's, you know, we have learned about ESG over the last two years. Uh, was the launch of our fund. And uh, it's important to see that there is a real evidence that ESG works. And uh, it's, it's just a matter of time that ESG will become a huge uh, investment opportunity. And now is the time for all investors to get in. And uh, I, I would just say that it is important that all investors should make ESG a core part of their portfolio. Great. 
So thank you once again, Chirag and Sneha for uh, imparting so much knowledge on ESG and sustainable investing with us. Uh, thank you to all the participants for joining us for this webinar. Our speakers have tried to answer most of your questions. However, in case you have any further queries, please get in touch with us. You can visit our website, www.quantumamc.com or get in touch with our customer care team. A recording of this webinar will be uploaded on our Quantum YouTube channel next week. Thanks everyone, stay healthy and stay safe. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.